Okay, so my talk today is that's not data science. Um, my name is Mara Averick, in case you did not catch that. I work at our studio where I am um, the Tidyverse developer advocate, which um, to clarify, I am not a real data scientist. Uh, I don't know if everyone in the back can see this Venn diagram. Um, you probably all are incredibly familiar with every single element of it, but I myself am not, so I kind of don't define myself that way. Um, so what, what do I do? Well, I like to think of myself as kind of the gruff but lovable driver, mechanic, and occasional muscle for the Tidyverse team. Um, this is from Archer, a show that you guys don't have here, but through which I pretty much interpret my entire life, so brace yourselves for that. Um, much like a folksy B.A. Baracus, which for those of you who don't know, who that is, um, he was famously played by Mr. T, um, who some of you may know for his um, statistical work with the, um, with the Mr. T test. Um, yeah, so if you know who I am, it's probably because of Twitter. Um, I would say tweeting is like, maybe it's like 94% of what I do now that I work at our, I'm kidding, I don't tweet all day long, but that's kind of how I ended up being part of the R community, or like a visible part of the R community, <laughs> um, is that I have a tendency to basically like go on Twitter and do what I call like learning out loud, where I say, OMG, I just learned a thing, party emoji. Sometimes I also say what that thing is. Um, and this is like 100% selfish. I, basically started doing this as a way of like keeping track of the things that I was reading and learning. Um, and it, much to my surprise, was um, useful to other people. So back in the day of pre-Bowtie, Hadley, Hadley Wickham is my boss. I don't know if you guys have heard of him one way or another. Um, yeah, so like in, you know, pre-Bowtie, Hadley was Obviously, I, I think he probably needs to get out more, but uh, at, at that point in his life, he was saying, you know, like, I can't, if you want to make a non-technical contribution, I can't think of a better role model than data. And we, that's my handle on Twitter. Um, so that was a nice thing to say. And, you know, as scientists, I assume you want empirical evidence, which um, Edwin has kindly provided me with. So you know, really large sample size, robust study, I um, am super important to the success of Edwin's post on Twitter. Um, so major conclusion there is that it turns out that things that are selfish and things that are useful for other people, it's a nice little Venn diagram. Um, and I like to call that the free and open source software happy place. I think most people get into contributing to open source um, because they're doing something that they need to be doing for themselves. Um, or they don't need, to, I think people are slightly selfish, but that doesn't mean that you're not helping the community at large. Um, so kind of my origin story in brief is a three part, situation, um, basketball, the bat pig, which is that, um, well, that creature there. You can't see his ears, so you can't fully appreciate the fact that if a bat and a pig had a baby, that's what it would look like, and um, buffer. So I was in a Lego mobilizer, and I got really into tweeting like cute pictures of dogs. It was very labor intensive, hard to do. But um, yeah, so that was kind of like the beginning of me on social media. But um, I got into R probably 2001, 2002 because of fantasy basketball. Um, I know basketball isn't big here. It, as Hadley would say, um, he calls it sports ball. Uh, it is a uh, sport. 
that involves baskets and hands. Anyway, so um, fantasy basketball was like in high school, I'm very competitive. <laughs> so I basically taught myself this programming language to beat my friends at fantasy basketball, which as you can see here is mainly because I'm really cool. Um, I did have one fantasy league that banned the use of R, which was like I can't do it in Python or Excel. I, they still lose. Um, yeah, but the other part of things that kind of made this into a bit of an origin story for me is that um, working in sports analytics is a really interesting space. So you have people who are really into analytics, but because they work with coaches and teams, they're also really keenly aware that you can't just say, draft this player because the model says that you have to draft this player. So Dean Oliver is um, like a very big deal in basketball analytics. He's like, a, I think I have his, like his book like shows up, oh, basketball on paper. So you have one half, you have experts who are saying like you need to explain the models. And then you have people who really are anti-analytics. I had permission to use these tweets, but kind of uh, for the safety of this journalist, I decided to uh, take out his face. He stands by it though. I'll read this aloud. I know you're not supposed to do that with slides, but I feel like this, these two tweets are really special to me, which is, um, if you have great players, you're going to win games. Um, if you have bad players, you're going to lose games. What does analytics have to do with it? Okay, fair enough. Here's where it kind of goes off the rails. You put your best analytic team out there and he rolls out his best, one of you will lose. So at best, analytics works just 50% of the time. Um, you could say the same thing about football, like European foot, you know, like shooting. Only, you know, like if you, if one team goes out there and tries shooting and another team goes out there and tries shooting the ball, um, one of them's gonna lose. So that really at best works 50% of the time. And that is a real verified sports ball reporter. So other half of my origin story is that in university, I studied what was then called science and society, um, which I like to say I now know everything about science and or society. So if anyone has any questions about that, um, find me after. Uh, yeah, it's better known kind of these days as science and technology studies. It's actually really grown and become kind of quite popular. Um, and it's like sociology, history, philosophy, anthropology of science. Um, and so I've always kind of been at this like weird nexus of studying and interacting with people who know a ton about things that I know very little about, which means that you have to get really good at kind of communicating um, across boundaries. Um, one element of it is like studying cultures of scientists themselves. And um, this is like one of my favorite science and technology studies pieces ever where she said, you know, like many social groups that do not reproduce themselves biologically, the experimental particle physics community renews itself by training um, novices. I did ask Hadley about this with respect to the tidyverse and he said there's actually a whole budding process that I'd missed out on, but um, I think training novices is what we do too. Uh, yeah, so academic origins, like I wrote some papers with toxicologists and stuff like that. Um, these all have links except for the nano education one because they only published one volume of that journal, which had an article I wrote in it, and then they just stopped publishing the journal, which I know correlation isn't causation, but um, I felt pretty cool after that. Uh, yeah, so my thesis work was, uh, and who wouldn't want to write a thesis on this, uh, ethical, legal, and social implications of nanotechnology. So I was part of a research team called NERT. Um, and we had three PIs, sociologist, a toxicologist, and a chemical engineer, which I always feel like sounds like the start of a weird joke. But um, yeah, so I had to interview 140, like basically anybody doing anything having to do with anything really, really small 
in the entire university. And this is like pre-dictation being good, so I had to transcribe like 144 hours of interviews, um, and which was really fun. And But the thing, again, you get really comfortable listening to and talking about material that you know very little about, um, or you know kind of only a cursory amount of information about it, but kind of gleaning what you, what you need to know in order to communicate and figuring out what you don't need to know um, because you're not a particle physicist or a toxicologist or anyone else. So um, just to kind of go back to that Hadley quote, I don't know if you noticed kind of the secret, there, there was like a bit of a burn in there. Um, and then I, Hadley felt guilty and he's like, oh, I didn't want to say that she's not technical, sad face. Um, and then Lucy McGowan, who's awesome, um, I think she really put it well, you know, she was saying like I read as, you know, Mara has the ability to translate quite technical material to a non-tech audience. So if you've, you know, uh, if you're non-tech, she's a fire go-to to dancing girls trophy emoji, which is really kind of what I aspire to be in the world. Um, sorry, water. And I'm, I'm kind of a word nerd, so I, well, you'll be learning some vocabulary today. Um, there's a word for that. <laughs> it's called exoteric. Um, means understandable by outsiders or the general public. I was going to call myself like an exoterrorist, and that didn't work, and like exotericist didn't work, so I, I just go with that B.A. Baracus gif instead. Um, and the way I like to think of this is that, um, you know, like I deal with a lot of material that is, to me, kind of half in English and half in squiggly. Um, I actually made that gif when I was relearning topology and somebody pointed out, they're like, oh, those squigglies are um, contour lines. And I was like, oh, that's topography. But, um, but thank you, imager. Yeah, so like kind of what do I try to do? I try and communicate across the English squiggly divide. Um, which is a thing that I made up. But also in terms of the people that you work with doing data science and uh, doing not data science, uh, it's, it's like a pretty crucial skill to have. Um, but like who, who cares about boundaries? Who really kind of, other than people who like to make Venn diagrams, who cares about boundaries? Well, it turns out humans care a lot about boundaries and categorization. It's like how we operate in the world. Um, philosophers, academics, scholars care a lot about boundaries. Um, it's, it's the way that we reason about and learn about new things. Um, and it also turns out that statisticians care a whole lot about boundaries. Um, I don't know if anyone here read, there was um, David Donahoe wrote a paper called 50 Years of Data Science. Did anyone see that? No? That's fine. I'll give you the takeaway message, <laughs> which, you know, like a lot of it's like, okay, is this statistics? Is this data science? And, you know, he's saying that, like, basically, like, this is cultural appropriation of statistics. Like, you're stepping on our turf. This isn't a legit thing. So, yeah, statisticians care a lot about boundaries, too. Um, and just in general, we care about boundaries. This is um, Suminen and Toyanen. I don't know if I'm saying their names right, did a study looking at kind of boundaries of journals and, you know, like where does computer science fit into it? And it's something that we're kind of continually fascinated by. Um, but also it's something kind of across which we need to communicate. So that's kind of act one. I told you I was going to talk about what is and is not science. So naturally I'm going to start like at um, 700 BC, feels like a good point at which point science was basically anything where you were saying causality doesn't have to do with the gods it, like that's considered scientific so if you're like oh the wind's blowing like Aeolus I can't remember the wind god but if you're saying like oh this probably has to do with trees you don't have to be right about it but that's still scientific um, but it turns out at that point they're actually not calling it science at all um, they're calling it philosophy, actually, they're calling it natural philosophy. Um, 
So around like 40, this is a slide wherein I go from 40 to B, 40 BC to 1620, just so this isn't that long. Um, yeah, so you've got Aristotle shows up, Andronicus of Rhodes like transcribes his work in 40 BC, and he's all about induction, being like you can reason, you know, from first principles, and then you have he writes the Organon, and Francis Bacon, who's a little bit of a jerk, um, shows up in like 1620 with like, well, actually, it's really about induction, and then there's all these really big fights. So we just covered all of the history of science between 40 BC and 1620. I'm so glad that you guys received that education. Um, so like Age of Enlightenment, they got, they, uh, various people got really into trying to map and condense like all of human knowledge. Um, and there was a project called, oh gosh, a lot of you speak French, so it's gonna be awkward when I mispronounce these things, but L'Encyclopédie um, and Diderot and D'Alembert basically um, spent, it took 20 years <laughs> for them to publish this book, which is cool when you see how big it is. Um, so basically, like this is the age of enlightenment, but they really believed in the fact that humans from all different walks of life could contribute. Um, it ended up being um, a, a huge collaborative endeavor with people who were from all different trades and who knew their specialties. So. Um, L'Encyclopédie has amazing plates that I love. So some of it is stuff that we would like definitely recognize as being science-y or math-ish. Algebra seems pretty legit. Uh, surgery, um, not the setup I personally would go for, but you know, we're talking 1740s, so that's pretty cool. Um, this one I just like, because that seems like a terrible setup for dental surgery. Um, Natural history, Gibbons, like, yeah, okay, that's, you know, what we recognize as science today. But also, like, there's an atelier. They have artists, like, coming in and being like, this is how, this is how we paint, and this is how paints are made, because they really are domain, they're craftspeople, but they're domain expertise, uh, domain experts. Um, this one I just threw in because um, I always wondered what goblin dye was, because it sounded so awesome. Um, but it turns out Goblin was the name of this family who was like really great at making dye. Um, but again, like they go to the experts to get the information. Um, and so this is this whole model of, uh, you know, like kind of collective knowledge and bringing it all together so everyone can have it. And by everyone I can have it, I mean like a couple places can have it because it's 20 volumes with 71,000 some odd articles. Um, and that was L'Encyclopédie. At the same time, we have institutions of science. Well, when I say same time, I mean kind of broadly. Um, in France, we have Académie des Sciences. So that's um, 1667, Colbert is, not Stephen Colbert, which, gosh, we are not in America. I don't know if you guys know who that is. Um, yeah, so he's like presenting to Louis the. 14th in 1667, yeah, that sounds good. Pretend it is. Um, yeah, so in France they have some stuff going on, good for them. Um, and in England, I don't, know if you, uh, I don't know if you're history buffs, but like France and England had some tensions, so they were kind of doing their own thing a little bit. Um, yeah, so in London they have the Royal Society um, for natural knowledge. Nobody is really using the word science at this point. Um, and the Royal Society had uh, these kind of philosophical tractions. And I, I spent a long time being like, how am I really going to prove that they called it philosophy all this time? And then I remembered that PhD literally stands for a doctorate of philosophy. So QED. Um, but yeah, so when these kind of institutions of science came along, it's a really different approach from what they were doing with L'Encyclopédie. Um, they kind of set out what I call the Royal Society comms squad goals, it's like how they wanted to communicate. Um, so, and everything that's in italics is direct quotes. Uh, so what were their goals? Like to separate knowledge of nature, which is what they're trying to get, from all that awful stuff, like colors of rhetoric, ooh, the worst, um, devices of fancy, who wants those involved? Not me, kidding. 
Uh, deceits of fables, oh man, the worst. And uh, basically ditch the language of, quote, wits and scholars, because that's going to be misleading. Everyone knows that. Um, and return to primitive purity and shortness, which just to, oh, and, and get as close to mathematical plainness as possible, which is a really great way to communicate with wide audiences, I found. Sarcasm. Um, and I also just like to point out that this is 1667, and they're saying, like, return to primitive purity and shortness. Like, we've always had this thing where we're like, oh, science has gotten out of hand. Like, everyone thinks that everyone's a scientist, and it's just not the case. And also, they use the word purity a lot, which is weird. So science, the term itself, is not that controversial. Enter a scientist. Big time controversial. Um, yes, yeah, so scientist, the story of a word. Uh, it's a title of honor, hotly contended for by economists, engineers, those jerk physicians always trying to pretend to be scientists, um, psychologists, and others. Um, and I kind of adapted this a little bit for the data science crowd, which um, is my take on like what you read about data scientists, which is that like the Appalachian data scientist is considered a sexy title because that's what they always use. Um, hotly contended for by, I don't know, but it makes me mad. You kind of get that vibe sometimes when you uh, are reading debates about data science. Um, so the person who's credited with coining the term scientist is William Huell, who he's credited with it, but he also like he did it anonymously, and he pretended to be a woman because um, he was like, I don't, wanna, I don't want anyone to think I'm doing this. He eventually kind of came out. Um, but yeah, in the 19th century, uh, everyone was using natural philosopher, um, experimental philosopher, and, uh, but they, they needed a word to kind of better refine this. And even Huell, who coined the term, uh, there's actually like a lexicographic burn in there. He's saying, you know, we have other terms like this, you know, economist, atheist, and sciolist, which um, means a super superficial pretender to knowledge. So, like, even he is kind of, like, slighting his own term. Um, but essentially, like, historically, this is, now we're in 19th century, not the date of that paper, <laughs> but um, essentially, like, they needed a new word to describe what people were doing. Again, like, I think that's kind of what's happened with data science. It's, you know, like, this is something that's a little bit different from the terms that we're used to using. Um, and some of their major concerns were that um, it was going to, you know, really degrade what was the labors of love of these scientists into a, you know, matter of drudgery for profit. Um, so, like, even people who weren't rich and in the Royal Society, like, wouldn't file patents because that would make them like not as cool as anyone else. Um, and then if we pan back to Donahoe's 50 years of data science, they're actually like the parallels continue. Uh, so the field of data science, they're like, well, it's motivated by commercial rather than intellectual developments. If you want to translate that into like 19th century speak, it's basically like labors of love versus for profit. Um, so a lot of people were upset about the term. Thomas Huxley being one of them, AKA Darwin's bulldog. Fun fact for you, yeah. Uh, he basically is like, yeah, this is like a vogue word bandied about, about as pleasing as electrocution, um, which is another like underhanded burn because that's also an Americanism, which is so embarrassing. Um, and I would also like to point out that this is in a journal called Science Gossip which I just like that he's defending the honor of science gossip. Um, and I actually had them help me out at the uh, Biodiversity Heritage Library, get me the original like science gossip covers, and it turns out that that's actually the wrong science gossip. There are two like major journals called science gossip. So it's actually the Carrington one. Um, and they essentially like wrote to all the big wigs in science, being like, all right, are we really gonna get on board with this word? And um, Carrington had some feelings about it. He was not that into it. Uh, he's, you know, saying like it's a it's a mongrel of a word. 
Uh, so then they decided to like pull some people who are kind of a big deal. Um, you've got like the Duke on, they're, they're really into titles saying like, it's not for, I wouldn't use it, but it exists. Um, Lovick is like, why don't we use philosopher? And we're like, oh, we already covered that ground, but thanks for saying it again. Uh, Sir Raleigh is like, well, there's nothing we can do about it now. Cat's out of the bag. Um, and then uh, Gunther is basically saying like the ultimate insult where he's saying like, I believe it's an American import, so. Watch, watch your step, um, which I'm sure is, you can all appreciate. Um, yeah, so finally they start using scientists. In Nature, the journal, said that they would never let it um, sully the pages of their journal. That only lasted for about 20 years. I have pointed out to them several times that 17,805 separate articles do use the word scientist, and no one's gotten back to me about that misleading letter in science gossip in 1864. So um, once we had like the word exists, people are still like pretty cheeky about it. So Ernest Rutherford, who's from New Zealand, he's like, yeah, okay, scientists, we'll divide them into two groups. We have physicists and stamp collectors. Um, and he won a Nobel Prize. He's like considered the, you know, the father of nuclear physics. He won a Nobel Prize in chemistry and like I thought I was making a really good joke being like oh you won a Nobel Prize in stamp collecting turns out like he also didn't want his Nobel Prize in chemistry so <laughs> those scientists from New Zealand are just kind of the worst I'm kidding Hadley if you ever see this yeah um, and I, I love a good portmanteau so um, you know all scientists you've got physicists stamp collectors and I'm gonna go ahead and propose that at the intersection we call them physiolatilists so if you guys um, run into any stamp collecting physicists let them know um, so what's everyone really freaking out about well vocab Pencreston basically means an explanation of a theory that becomes meaningless. Like if we're just using scientists to cover everything, what does it really mean? And I think like just in the dialogue around the word data science and data scientist, you can see that same kind of fear where it's like, you're not legit, you're not legit. And um, it's uh, kind of deeply entrenched. Uh, finally, like we came up with like, all right, what are the rules of science? Like universalism, anybody should be able to do it, not anyone, but basically like, it shouldn't matter if somebody's in the room, because spiritualism was a thing. Um, communalism, like it benefits a greater good. Disinterestedness, not meaning that you don't like, find your subject interesting, but meaning <laughs> that uh, you're not, you don't have like a vested interest in it. And organized skepticism. All right, so we've covered all of science. Data sciencing, so what's that? Um, it looks exactly like this, and that's, about it, I, as a tidyverse developer advocate, I hope you know that I used read underscore CSV, so I just did some sweet advocating. Um, but you know, so like you've had this and then I am not a parent, but um, I imagine, you know, like everyone has a day where finally their child asks them like, mom, where, where do data come from? which is awkward, um, you know, and you're like, science, and you want to say okay, but is science a dispassionate recording of facts and uncertainty? Well, let's see, like, it, is that, is it total objectivity? Well, there's some other things that go on. So science is a thing we're into, um, but science also happens in context, which, insert Archer GIF here, context. So what does doing science look like? Um, I don't know, how many people here are like lab scientists, anyone? Yeah, cool, so the, the core, they, they got a Nobel Prize too and they weren't even pissed about it. Classy. Um, yeah, the, the Corys, they, you know, so sometimes it looks like that. Um, sometimes it looks like this, like you're sailing on the Pacific for two months and you haven't slept in like weeks and you're like sending data into NOAA because nobody else is in the middle of the Pacific and maybe that's kind of sketchy data. It wasn't, you only get to wear bunny ears if you do it right three times in a row. Um, 
science can also look like this. I don't. I wrote nonprofit grant proposals for about five years. Uh, has anyone here ever applied for a grant? No. Oh, gosh, you guys are really lucky. In America, that's like all hands go up because that's how you get money. Um, yeah, so science also is based on like what gets funded, what makes it rain euros. I adapted that. Um, very culturally competent. Um, yeah, so, and it also looks like this, which it doesn't, oh my God, if your data looks like that, you have a horrible problem. But it all, you know, like, I hope it doesn't. You know, it also looks like we're getting data and we're importing it and um, we don't necessarily know where it comes from. Um, so yeah, that, that's what I mean by context. Um, and in socio, in science and technology, at two STS things here, we call those socio-technical systems. Um, and sometimes they're even complex socio-technical systems. So you're dealing with things, two of which have emoji, <laughs> Uh, transportation and medicine, where you have mutually incompatible constraints and you're trying to make the best possible decision given that there's uncertainty and that's what we're using data science for some of the time. But it still is a matter of knowing where your data comes from and knowing what's behind your data. Um, and I think that that's something that can get lost really easily. I recently have been on a tirade about that. Has anyone ever used MT cars, the data set? All right, I don't want to upset everyone, but two of those cars have rotary engines, which do not have cylinders, despite what it says. And then they go ahead and say that the Porsche 914 2 has a V shaped engine, which everyone knows that it's a Volkswagen boxer. Um, I know one other person who cares, but my point being is that, um, like, and literally on all of the internet, the point being is that, like, you actually, like, if you were really going to be saying some things about MT cars, which they're 1974 vehicles, they're always like, maybe that one's an SUV. No, it's not. Um, but you do need that domain expertise. You need somebody who can be like, there's no way there's a four-cylinder V-shaped engine. That's ridiculous, which I'm sure you all know. Um, so what about R? Is she going to bring that up? Or? Yeah, no, I'm super into it. Um, I do really important things with R, um, like, you know, text analysis to see what the most distinctive terms are for um, Dr. Krieger Algernop, who's best known for being an archer. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so my favorite tools, I use R. Are you shocked? R Studio and the tidy, oh. Okay, <laughs> we're gonna go right through that slide. Yeah, so why do I use those tools? Um, part of it is that it's a language that's designed for science and um, it is closer to the way of, at least for me, the way I think like verbs like filter and gather like make more sense to me than like bracket, bracket, variable name, comma, that maybe I include or maybe I forget to. I don't know, maybe some of you think in brackets. I don't, personally, yet. Um, and what's R like really well known for? Well, data wrangling, um, which uh, Jenny Bryan, I really like coined the term data rectangling. And then I would even take it a step further, is that it helps me a lot with overall idea rectangling, which again, maybe you guys have very good rectangular thoughts. I do not, um, which means I am a very big fan of R Markdown because it kind of uh, brings together text, code, and output, um, which I always end up calling the holy trinity, which I realize it's not, but a trifecta. Um, at the same time, honestly, like, I also spend a lot of time just like writing crazy notes to myself. <laughs> um, Finally, that's a very small notebook blown up. Um, yeah, so I'm a big proponent of like, if you don't know how to make an idea happen on your computer, like do not carry that artifact with you into the rest of your research. Like figure out what you wanna do and then try and make it happen. That's like the number one thing that I think, especially when you're on a deadline can happen is that you end up throwing out really useful information just cause you don't know how to integrate it. Um, but, and like my, 
notes end up looking like archaeology. But eventually I get it into you know, the right format, um, which is weird, right? Because I'm a tidy versus dev advocate, and that's about as not tidy as you can get. Um, you know, I'm, like I'm banging a square peg in a round hole. Other half is kind of like I end up sharing these untidy efforts, which I think is how I ended up getting a pretty big Twitter following, is that people appreciate that. I think that um, it's about the process of what we're doing. And um, I think that people like to see that other people are also confused. Um, so like quick crash course on tradecraft of Twitter, should you choose to engage in it. Um, these are hypotheses. I share a lot of other people's content because it's good. Um, like my favorite example of that is Hillary Parker has a great post on how to write a package. And it's from 2014, but it's still super useful. I think novelty is highly overvalued. Uh, I'm not sure. The anatomy of a tweet, when I do them, I'm like, oh, this is a cool thing, using a package, tutorial, author handle, hashtag, maybe. Um, so that's what I think I do, but really, I think what people see is like, oh, this. They're like, oh, it's a pretty picture. Um, and I always do attribution. Um, sometimes I make gifts and people enjoy that as well. Um, and part of this is that I kind of try to embrace what's called directed forgetting. So um, essentially like I'm giving myself enough information so I remember what it was, but I don't force myself to memorize it because I know I have access to it later. Um, the tweet is not the actual content. This is me like butchering one of Jenny Bryan's slideshows, but it's also just me like getting as much as I need on there so I can remember what it was. Sorry, I'm going really fast now because it's 9.45. Um, my R's of tweeting, read or run, I, I don't know why you would tweet something you didn't read, but I suggest you read it. Um, relatable, sure, retrievable, that's what I'm in it for. Uh, relevant, sure, and real, like you do you. Don't tweet if you're not into tweeting. There are lots of other ways to learn out loud. Um, but you really like never know when your stupid tweet is gonna have an impact. Um, here, you know, Hadley is talking about a package called Pool, which is really useful, especially with Shiny, and I am contributing uh, really significantly by um, adding an Archer GIF of a pool. But then uh, Matthew Dickinson says, well, if it weren't for that GIF, I would have totally skipped over knowing about this package that looks to be a huge benefit to me. So what's a silly tweet now? <laughs> yeah, so uh, learning out loud is like not all about Twitter. There are so many ways to do it. Um, podcasts are big. Does anyone recognize that? What's it from? Yeah, Not So Standard Deviations is like an, uh, this great uh, podcast with Roger Peng and Hilary Parker. This is me saying like dialogue is totally back. There was a reason Socrates and uh, Boethius used it. I went with the Boethius comparison, but then I realized that like theoretically, now I have Roger Peng like in prison writing his last words because that's when Boethius did it. So not great. Um, but, you know, like it's really important that new people contribute. Uh, we re contributing to open source, open source software requires newcomers. Um, and although there are a lot of reasons that people kind of hold back from contributing, they actually turn out not to be great reasons. Um, Sustain was this cool conference that's happening again um, about keeping open source software, making it a sustainable ecosystem. And um, a, a lot of the emphasis there is saying like, we actually need to value more contributions that aren't just code. We need documentation. We need people who are sustaining and contributing at all levels, which is totally true. Um, so even though you should never use require, you should use library, but like essentially it requires noobs. I did a package review. I was worried the only thing I was gonna have to say was yes, it's a package. Um, but it turned out that our open side did that on purpose. You know, like it's valuable for somebody who's an expert to have feedback that says like, I have no idea what you just said. And that's how you make a better error message. Um, I don't want to totally cut into uh, Carol's time. So I'm going to skip really quickly to 
and I'll post these slides in case anyone ever cares about them. Um, you guys want to watch them as fast as humanly possible. Um, yeah, my first contribution was a very big deal. Um, and my dog's name ended up in R for Data Science. Sorry, there isn't a better way to skip to the total end. Reprex, greatest package of all time. Achieving Reprexcellence, very important. Um, yeah, here's the one I want. Oh. Hints for happy code contribution for the tidyverse. Get the pulse of a project, like is it active? Uh, watch the repo, super helpful. Read the code, turns out to be useful. Um, and discuss your ideas, which is useful for everyone. If you end up at wait but why again, well, things that are selfish and things that benefit other people are kind of at the heart of it. So um, it's also a nice way to give back to tools that you use. Um, this is an O'Reilly cover. O'Reilly didn't really publish it. Um, and also, if you need help getting started and are going to be at our studio comp, we're having a free Tidyverse developer day uh, after the conference at which we, uh, the tidy, most of the Tidyverse team will be there. And um, we can help you get started at any skill level because uh, we need your contributions. It's, you know, like the going to go with like Lenciclo PD model where really kind of we, we need everyone from all levels with all different types of backgrounds in order to uh, to do what we do and do it well so thank you